Okay, so here we are at part four. We're going to talk about class osteichthyes. I had said before, oste means bone, ichthyes means fish. That means they have a bone um, or their skeleton is made of bone. And sometimes their scales have a bony aspect to them. Their operculum has a bone in it that covers their gills. And they will either have lungs or a swim bladder. Yes, I said some of these fish will have lungs, and they are called lungfish, surprisingly. So subclass Sarcoptergi. Uh, sar sacro is flesh, and pteryx means fin. So these guys will have muscular lobes associated with their fins, and they use lungs for gas exchange. These are called the lobe-finned fish. They think that these fish might be kind of a, a, a link between um, land vertebrates and the, and the water vertebrates. Um, they live in regions where seasonal droughts are common, so their lungs are used uh, to help breathe air when the, the little puddles dry up on them. Coelacanths. Um, these are one of these lobe-finned fish, and they thought they went extinct. And then about 1938 in South Africa, they found one. And the reason they're so hard to find is because they typically swim in very deep waters. So it's not usually where people are swimming. Then in 1977, they found a different species of coelacanth off the coast of Indonesia. So they know that these guys still exist, um, but they're very um, lone types of animals. They don't, they don't come up in the levels where people commonly are. And then we have another extinct species, the Osteolo, Osteolopiforms. Um, they believe that these are the ancestors to the, our ancient amphibians, the amphibian ancestor. Okay, next subclass, the Actino, Actinopterygi. <laughs> um, actin means ray and pteryx means fin. So these are the ray-finned fish. And um, they do not have the muscular lobes. They have fins instead. These are what you would think of as a standard fish. They have something called a swim bladder. And you will be looking for it when you're dissecting the fish. This is a gas-filled sac that runs along their dorsal area of their back. And it helps keep them buoyant. They have the ability to either fill it with more gas or less gas so that they can um, kind of float up higher or deeper in the water. One of the groups of um, these fish is called chondrosteans. There are about 25 living species today. Their ancestral species had a bony skeleton, but the living members have a cartilaginous skeleton. So they kind of reverse the development of um, the cartilage part and their tail has an upper lobe that's pretty large and here you can see sturgeon are one example um, <clears throat> they live in the sea they migrate to the rivers to breed their bony plates cover the anterior of their body and that means the front um, and they're valued for their eggs this is where caviar comes from. And you can see in the top right hand picture, all that gray stuff, that is their eggs. That's a lot of caviar. Um, there's also paddlefish in this particular um, subclass. And they are large. They live in freshwater. And their rostrum or their nose has a paddle shape to it. They have very specific sense organs in this rostrum that um, can sense electricity and um, it helps them you know I think they swim in kind of uh, murky water so they need something other than their vision to help them sense their surroundings they are filter feeders and they'll live in lakes and rivers of the Mississippi River Basin okay so this other group is called Neopterygi they uh, have two primitive uh, genuses that live in the freshwaters of North America. There's one that's called, um, I mean, it's a dogfish or bowfin. They have garp-like thick scales and long jaws. 
So most of the living fish that are members of this group are referred to as teleosts or modern bony fishes. The number of teleost species exceeds 24,000. And when you think of fish, these are the animals that will pop into your head. Largest successful vertebrate group are the fish. And they have a variety of adaptations for a variety of um, environments. Why are they successful? Well, they're able to adapt to their environment. They can extract the oxygen from small amounts of oxygen per unit volume. There's actually not as much oxygen in water as there is in the air, and they're able to filter that out pretty easily with their gills. They have efficient locomotor structures, meaning their fins. They have high sensory si systems, um, so not only do they have their vision, but they have those lateral lines. Some of them can detect electric uh, fields. And they have efficient reproduction. They can produce a large number of offspring so that many of them will survive to reproduce themselves. For locomotion, they have a streamlined shape. They can uh, secrete kind of a mucus to help lubricate their body and it reduces the friction between the fish and the water. They use their fins and body well to push against the water. Um, and then it, if you read down at the bottom, it says the muscles provide the power for swimming and constitute up to 80% of the fish itself. So when you're eating fish, it, you're eating these swimming muscles essentially. The trunk and tail musculature propels a fish, and the muscles are arranged in a zigzag, zigzag band called a myomere, and they have the shape of a W on the side of the fish. Internally, the bands are folded and nested, um, and that way they can pull on several vertebrae and they have better leverage. Okay, nutrition and digestion. Most of the fish are predators, and they're always searching for food. They'll eat things like invertebrates, vertebrates. They can swallow their prey whole. Um, they'll capture their prey. They can suction close their opercula and then rapidly open their mouth to kind of suck the prey in. Um, some of them are filter feeders and they use gill rakers that help trap the plankton while the fish is swimming with their mouth open. And then there are some fish that are herbivores and omnivores. Here you can see a whale shark on the left, this is one of those filter feeders, and he kind of opens his mouth and sucks all the water with food in there and kind of filters out the plankton. And then on the right, you can see a, a grouper fish swimming amongst other littler fish. Okay, circulation and gas exchange. Their heart only has two chambers. Our hearts have four. Um, so a fish heart only has one atria and one ventricle and the blood just circulates in one loop. So the blood from the body comes to the heart um, and it's deoxygenated, that's why the arrows are blue. You may wanna, um, you can even draw this picture in if you want to. Um, and it goes from the atria to the ventricle and then the blood is pumped to the gills. So it's still deoxygenated. The gills is where they drop off carbon dioxide and the blood picks up oxygen and then it circulates it through its body. So when you're looking for the heart in the fish, you're actually going to, it's gonna be almost um, backwards. You're going to see the ventricle will be more towards the head of the fish and the atria will be more towards the back part of the fish as far as direction. It'll be, the ventricle will be more anterior and the atria will be posterior. So here's another description of the cycle or the loop. So the blood enters the heart through a vein. It exits through a vein on its way to the gills. Um, and then in the gills, the blood picks up oxygen from the surrounding water, leaves the gills in arteries which go throughout the body. The oxygen gets used, goes back to the heart, dumps off carbon dioxide, and it's a very simple one loop system. Now let's take a look at the gills. They are composed of a couple different things. They have a gill arch, which gives the gill some rigid support. 
and then there are gill filaments that are always paired and then they have something called secondary lamellae where that's where the gas exchange actually takes place and it's when you see the gills you can see they're going to have a very feathered appearance and that helps to increase surface area so they can exchange more gases and here's a diagram you can see the gill filaments kind of um, but in this picture they had to cut off the operculum because it covers these gills the blood flows through the gill and the filaments in the opposite direction from the water passing through the gills and this this is called a counter current flow um, but this way they're able to get the most oxygen out of the water into the blood so you can see here the blood is flowing um, you can see artery and vein there where the blood is going in and out and then the um, the counter current flow <clears throat> of the blood from one side to the other goes in the opposite direction of the water flow. The, the blue, big blue arrows are the water, the little black arrows are going to be the blood flow. And here's just a picture again showing you the gills, the water, the blood, and how it's all flowing through there. Uh, another diagram just showing how the blood vessels are aligned in each of those filaments. Um, how do the fish ventilate their gills? How do they actually get water to pass through there? Um, they can do it a couple different ways. They can use something called ram ventilation or they use a double pump system. Ram ventilation, this is where the fish will have their mouth open and swim through the water to ram water into their mouth. Um, these are things like the great white shark, the mako shark, salmon shark, whale shark, tuna. That's why these guys can't stop swimming because otherwise they would suffocate. And then the double pump system, um, it kind of, they use their their gills and suction to kind of suck water in. They close their gills at one point um, to try and create that suction and then they open them and close their mouth and it's kind of like this little um, elaborate contraction system that helps to bring water in and pass it forcefully over the gills to get the oxygen out of it. And just an FYI, when fish are taken out of the water, they suffocate. And it's not because they can't breathe the oxygen in the air, but it's because their gill arches collapse and there's not enough surface area for diffusion to take place. Um, there's actually fish that can survive out of water, like the lungfish that we talked about that helps them breathe air. Catfish can kind of do this as well. And it is possible for a fish to suffocate in the water. This can happen when their oxygen has been used up by another organism. Um, when they have red tides in the, um, in the oceans or even in lakes, it's because there's a, an extra um, large amount of bacteria. And um, these bacteria, when they decompose, they use up a lot of oxygen, um, and that takes the oxygen away from the fish, and then they die. Okay, one more little thing here on circulation and gas exchange. They do have swim bladders that are filled with gases. Um, this isn't more really for gas exchange per se, but it, it does have a gas within it, um, and it helps them stay buoyant in the water um, so that they can you know, figure out what depth that they, they want to go to and fill their, their swim bladder accordingly. So this is kind of an important thing to remember. There's four ways a fish can maintain their vertical position, staying upright in the water, because you can think if you've ever gone <clears throat> swimming in a body of water, um, it's hard to orient yourself because you're you're more buoyant in the water and you can't feel the pull of gravity as well. So number one, fish are saturated with buoyant oils, um, so especially in their liver. And that's when we get to the shark, you're going to you're going to see all of the oil that they have. Um, number two, they use their fins to provide lift to keep them upright. 
Three, the reduction of heavy tissues. So their bones are less dense. Some of them have cartilaginous skeletons. And then many of them have swim bladders that help maintain their vertical position in the water. So this is the last slide for this section of the notes. Um, there's one more section that you can um, continue on or take a break.